Mm-hmm. Statement 17 uh, of chapter 3. So this is uh, one of the key statements, uh, I think, um, if we uh, understand and not forget this point, then this really helps us understand many of the other statements. Um, in a way, you could say that uh, it is applying um, the uh, statement 17, uh, applying the principle uh, shown in statement 17, and that then Kyoba Rinpoche, under the other situations and circumstance, um, state things the way he state things, which is that, according to Kyoba Rinpoche, not knowing uh, avidya, uh, mishepa, uh, that is delusion, is the much greater fault. So not knowing, which is also the same as delusion. Delusion being one of the three poisons. Delusion means confusion. I often use the word confusion. Uh, More generally, you will find in Buddhist writings in English, it's the word ignorance. Uh, ignorance but I think ignorance has a more new um, passive sense you know when you say someone is ignorant yeah a more passive sense uh, here delusion or confusion connotes um, un- unsettling yeah? it's unsettling not knowing avidya that is delusion, is the much greater fault. So this is in response to people claim that concerning all faults, desire and especially hatred are great faults, while not knowing is a lesser fault. So apparently there were people who said, who say this, you know, so this is related to the, in terms of the three poisons, they say, Desire and especially hatred is a great fault. According to them, of these three poisons, not knowing is not so bad. Now, you might say, you know, no, 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 nobody says this. Yeah, nobody says this. We all know, you know, in Buddhism, ignorance is at the root of all the problems. Sure, uh, maybe now nobody says this stated in this way. Uh, when, when stated in this way, uh, as in this other view, people claim that concerning all faults, desire and especially hatred are great faults, while not knowing is a lesser fault. Uh, then you say, and uh, nobody, yeah, I mean, who are these people? You know, the people don't say this. You know, no Buddhist will say this. True, no Buddhist will say this explicitly like this. But if you investigate the way they talk about the other things, you'll find that underlying the way they talk about other things is actually based on this. It's actually based on this idea that of the three poisons, the worst is hatred, desire, eh, it's okay. And not knowing, oh, that's, that's not so bad. Here, Kyoba Rinpoche says, actually, of the three, the most dangerous is not knowing. So this principle, therefore, uh, you can see how it underlies, for example, his his, uh, statement, his rather kind of, uh, uh, in some way, shocking statement, uh, which is to say, you know, between not taking a vow and breaking the vow, and taking a vow, and then breaking the vow, the second scenario, 
has redeeming factors that the first scenario doesn't have. You, you understand that point already, right? What we've been talking about. Yeah. And there you can see what's going on is he says, right? The second scenario, taking the vow and breaking it, has redeeming factors that in the first scenario doesn't have. Because in the first scenario, there is no vidya, there is no knowing going on. In taking the vows, you have introduced some understanding into the picture. So that when inevitably you are going to break the vow, the fact of having taken the vows will shine some light into the situation and show how, you know, that is unskillful. That, that is unskillful. Uh, so that, that kind of a statement, right, is based on this uh, statement here. Not knowing, which is delusion, is the much greater fault. Uh, so now let's look at Chodra's commentary. In general, transmigrating in samsara is precisely due to the fault of not knowing. And this not knowing does not refer to not seeing things and so on. It refers to delusion. Desire, hatred, and the other afflictions arise from delusion. Therefore, the root of samsara is delusion. The Sancha Yagata says that any being, whether minor, mediocre, or supreme, arises from cognitive misorientation has been taught by the Tathagata. So this quote simply says, you know, simply means from avidya, from not knowing. Then all beings, you know, all, all types of beings that exist in samsara is the result of not knowing. So this is, you know, again, the, the, when it's stated in this way, you know, no, I think no Buddhist uh, would, would argue and say, oh, no, 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 actually it's due to other reasons. Yeah? Furthermore, the exalted one proclaimed to Upali, desire is a small fault, but difficult to part with. Hatred is a great fault but it is easy to part with. Delusion is both a great fault and difficult to part with. Uh, so this is actually a very good one, this quote. Uh, it really shows, you know, desire is a small fault relative to the other two, but very difficult to part with. Yeah, what we like to eat, uh, where we like to be, who we like to be with, you know. In the big picture, you know, it's not causing a lot of harm yeah. relative to like a hatred. Yeah. But it's so easy. I mean, it's so difficult yeah, to get rid of. desire. Hatred, on the other hand, is a great fault because, you know, when that arises, you can immediately see the damage that it will cause. But because, precisely because, you know, it, 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 it's, its ugly consequence yeah, is so obvious, and then it is easy yeah, to be done with it. If nothing else, you know, with old age, you have no more energy, you know, to be that angry that often. Yeah, you're just like, eh, you know. But desire, you know, like old people are very stubborn. That's related to desire, you know. The older we get, you know, the less 
amenable to changing our habits. So that's very hard to part with. And then it says, delusion, finally, is both a great fault and also difficult to part with. Within this, this Vajra statement, quote, because the animals have greater delusion, they are the lowest of the six beings is also included. And this is a statement that is pretty kind of shocking. It's one of the Vajra statements. It's in the appendix. It's not in one of the main seven chapters. It's in the appendix or in, in the uh, auxiliary chapter, chapter eight, where Kyoba Rinpoche actually says, actually of the six realms of existence, yeah, from this perspective, the animal realm, uh, because the predominant uh, afflictive emotion there is delusion. Uh, whereas in the other realms, when they suffer uh, or when they're happy, uh, it is said that they have the ability uh, to kind of reflect and say, oh, uh, but it is said that uh, in the animal realm, they have no capacity uh, to, to think clearly. They don't understand why they suffer. They don't understand why they're happy. Now, of course, I can say, you know, like, we don't know, you know, whether they know or they're not, they don't know. But this is what is being pointed out, that from this perspective, in terms of delusion being the most uh, dangerous and difficult to get rid of, the animal realm uh, in general uh, is then even lower in that sense. Since the beings of the hell realms and hungry ghosts have a very clear mind, the regret and suffering of thinking, quote, through which former actions have I been born like this, arises, and the mindfulness of thinking, quote, in the future I will not do it again, unquote, will also arise. Moreover, since such regret and mindfulness are two of the four powers of the antidote, yeah, four powers out of the four powers of purifying negative karma, they comprise a special method of purifying evil. Similarly, animals are also born in their realm like other beings due to their specific karma. However, since they are dumb, they only do negative things such as eating each other again and again because they, they do not even know that such deeds are included in the non-virtuous categories, right? they are the lowest. <clears throat> so says Sadharma right? Anusmriti Pashtana says, being born in the hell realms, transmigrate easily, right? meaning you can get out. Right? Being born in the animal realms are different. Therefore, hell beings and hungry ghosts transmigrate and are born in happier existences, or since their karma is quickly exhausted due to their great suffering, even in the heavenly realms. But animals make new accumulations of non-virtue through their bodies and are reborn in the other two lower realms, or are again reborn as animals and so forth. Since they must experience such results, they suffer greatly for a long time. Uh, so again, here, you know, it's pointed out that uh, for me, you know, this question is, of course, like, how are we going to uh, suffer or experience the experiences that we have in the world? Are we going to experience it as a hungry ghost? Are we going to experience it as a hell being? Or as, are we going to experience it as an animal, so to say? Okay. To experience it as an animal is to simply experience both the happiness and the suffering without any consideration. Where does this come from? You know, why? And, and no, not taking advantage of when suffering arises to, to reflect and say, this is the ripening of negative activities, unskillful actions, 
Yeah, you know, and then when happiness arises, uh, to recognize this is due to having made uh, skillful choices. Uh, if we don't have that, uh, then essentially we're going about like quote unquote dumb animals. Yeah. And if we go about like that, then there is no escape. We will do again and again and again and again. Because then, yeah, if we think, you know, happiness and suffering just happens, right? It just happens. Then we don't think that it is due to choices made. Then we don't change the way we act. So as I said, you know, everything the Buddha gave is about helping us Make better choices. I did not say making better choices is easy. A lot of times, even when we can see what the better choice is, we still cannot make the better choice. But even that, it's better to see. And, and then, you know, say, oh, I'm not say, but... See, huh? and then even if you cannot make the better choice, even if you know that is the better choice, yeah, then at least, again, this is the point about, there is some saving grace in this situation. Uh, even as you are walking yourself into trouble, uh, you recognize that. Rather than not seeing, not knowing, and then habitually, going on and on and on, like a dumb animal. And simply go through life like that. Then, yeah, again and again, we're going to repeat the patterns without any awareness. Uh, last weekend, you know, like part of the Sang teachings, uh, I said, uh, this point about how we talk about body, speech, and mind as actions yeah, in Buddhist texts, right? Actions of body, speech, and mind. Yeah? There, there's something very profound that we take for granted or don't notice, yeah? the profundity of that statement, yeah? which is yeah, speech and actions, you know, physical actions, right? Speech and physical actions. Yeah, we're like, oh yeah, those are actions. But often, with our thoughts and our emotions, we don't think of them as actions. Right? Yeah, I don't know about you. I can tell you about myself. I don't often think of my thoughts and speech. I mean, my thoughts and emotions, my thoughts and my feelings as actions. But the Buddha points out, no, 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 they are actions. They are choices that we are making. But it's so subtle. We think our thoughts and our feelings just happen. Just happen. No, they don't just happen. We create them. They are choices made. Very subtle. Now I remember last weekend I was talking about this and then I was talking about road signs in Ladakh. Then I completely forgot to finish that thought. <laughs> uh, in Ladakh, uh, the roads are very uh, windy. Uh, and then I was saying how in Bhutan, they are windy roads, but they don't have these funny signs that you see in Ladakh. But in Ladakh, uh, in these windy roads, uh, there's one sign. Uh, it says, mm, accidents are caused. I say, oh, that's a profound statement. You know, accidents are are caused. And we normally think, you know, oh, it's an accident, uh, as if uh, it's not caused and it's not based on choices that have been made. They are choices. They are actions. You know, accidents don't just happen. <laughs> right? They are caused. Likewise, our thoughts and our 
feelings. Huh? They are actions. And so this is related to this statement here. You know? Can we see? Can we see this? Huh? That not knowing that our thoughts and our feelings are actions will keep us perpetually in this cycle of confusion. Uh, Sobish's notes uh, provide some other context for understanding uh, uh, this statement. Yeah? So I think it's very helpful here. Uh, again, again, you know, his notes are really helpful. Since it is the Bodhisattva's ideal to work tirelessly for the benefit of sentient beings, some people claim that hatred is the greatest fault, whereas desire and not knowing are lesser faults. So yeah, so sometimes you will see uh, in some teachings, uh, some, some, some people will say, uh, for bodhisattvas especially, uh, hatred is the worst fault. And by implication, or sometimes directly, they will say desire and confusion or ignorance uh, or not knowing, then lesser faults. So this is sort of like saying, if compassion and love is the most important, then its opposite uh, is the worst. Uh, and also, it's in this context that Kyoba Rinpoche is saying, no, actually, even for bodhisattvas, the greater uh, obstacle, the greater problem is still not knowing. It's still delusion. Dojya Sherap refers to a well-known passage of the Upali Paripritya Sutra, which states that the Bodhisattva gathers beings through desire, but abandons them through hatred. Therefore, hatred is the greater fault. Furthermore, he refers to the equally well-known verse in Shantideva's Bodhicaya Bhattara, according to which there is no greater wrong than hatred. Thus, for the Bodhisattva, hatred is said to be the worst affliction. Yeah, this is what's generally said. Moreover, it is generally taught in the context of the teachings on karma that hatred leads to hell realm, desire to the preta realm, and delusion to the animal realm. As for the degrees of non-virtue, a high degree is said to lead to hell, a medium degree to the preta realm, and a lower to the animal realm. Uh, so according to this way of dividing, right, what is the predominant afflictive emotion, then because hatred is the one that leads to hell realm, then yeah, some people say, therefore hatred is the worst. Second worst is desire. Third worst uh, is confusion or delusion. Furthermore, if someone commits a fault due to delusion based on not knowing it is a fault, the result is light. But to knowingly commit a fault is to deprecate the Buddha's commands, and thus is the gravest fault. Yeah, so, uh, the footnote, uh, Sobish says, this appears to be a very popular opinion. But it is difficult to find a supporting reference in the scriptures. And so he says, contemporary lamas of all Tibetan traditions mention it often in their public teachings, such as breaking a vow out of ignorance, carelessness, overpowered by your clashes are all negative, but they are not as bad because they are not as deliberate as breaking a vow out of irreverence. Yeah, I can tell you, I've heard many times like even very, uh, even lamas that, you know, I do respect, you know, I've, I've heard them say this. Then I, I always remember Kyoba's point and say, uh, here I have to disagree with you. Kyoba Rinpoche says, you know, at least if it is irreverence, right? Uh, you break, right? You actually know, you know, 
but not knowing and breaking. In the, when you look more into it, it's a lot worse. Uh, even like in like in culturally, you know, uh, uh, and and in the law of co- uh, in the law of the courts, you know, I think this this general opinion, this footnote opinion, uh, operates, you know, and that's why then we think karma also operates this way, uh, which is if you go if you if you stand before a, a law, a court of the law, right, and 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 uh, the the prosecutor can show, you know, that. You know it is wrong and you did it. Oh, they will punish you more than, you know, if your defender can convince uh, the jury that you didn't know. And so you did it, right? But that kind of a system, I will say, is based on a theistic underlying principle, which is some powerful being has set this rule. If you knowingly break it, it's a bigger offense. Why? Because you have offended this powerful being. Now, fundamentally, it's based on that idea. Because the offense is committed against an infinite object, the consequences of the offense is greater. As opposed to, well, I didn't know you said not to do it. Okay, in that case, less. Yeah? But Kyoba Rinpoche really points out, you know, karma doesn't work like this. When we really want to look at, you know, how we are stuck and how we need, what we need to do to get unstuck, and then you need to see that not knowing is a greater fault. And so here Sobish, you know, quotes from uh, Kempo Katar, uh, a, a very, you know, uh, a good Lama. He passed away at the age of close to 100, uh, maybe a couple of years ago. Uh, but I can, I can quote you, actually, his own as the Dalai Lama. <laughs> In his public teachings, he says, you know, uh, don't take the Bodhisattva vow, he says, unless uh, you are very sure you can keep the commitments. He says, meanwhile, just work on the commitments, but don't take the vow yet. Otherwise, you take the vow and then you break those commitments. He says, it's very negative. You know? so, so even he, you know, I'm not criticizing his own Dalai Lama. I'm just pointing out you know, how this is, yeah, this is a very common opinion. You know? But that opinion, you know, according to Kyoba Rinpoche, he's pointing out to us, you know, that is based on not really understanding what is going on. Yeah. So in his, uh, the way he points this out, he's like, no, 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 no. Don't worry about offending. It doesn't offend the Buddhas. Buddhas know, you know, that it's not easy. Buddhas don't judge, you know. Sometimes, I mean, again, intellectually, we think Buddhas, we know Buddhas don't judge, but emotionally, you know, we, 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 we still suspect maybe Buddha is judging me. You know, yesterday someone said something to me like, you know, oh, uh, uh, she has, a, I guess, some kind of, some kind of a timer of an electric candle on her shrine. And so the light will come on. And once the light comes on, uh, she knows ah, it's time to do uh, the Archi offering. And she said, oh, the lamp has come on. I have to go. Uh, and, and then I said, oh, very good. That's such a nice way, you know, to, to remind like, okay, it's time to do this. She said, yeah, I try my best. But then, you know, even that I fail. And then I said to her, I said, well, luckily, um, I said, you know, luckily Archie understands, you know. <laughs> luckily Archie understands. Now, of course, you know, 
saying that too much, you know, will get us lazy, you know. So sometimes, yeah, the text will say, you know, the Dharma palace like Achi will get very upset, you know, if we forget to do the daily offerings. But sometimes when we take that too literally, then we actually don't understand. As much as it might be skillful uh, to, to introduce some fear factor, you know, but if we don't really see clearly, then we will have wrong views about Buddhas. Uh, so then it came to me uh, yesterday as I was thinking about this and I thought, oh, it's good to remind people. Hmm? Mm. It's good to remind ourselves. It's good to remind people. Thankfully, the Buddha's compassion yeah, is not affected by my confusion. Oh, that's a good Buddhist bumper sticker. Yeah. Luckily, thankfully, the Buddha's compassion is not at all affected by my confusion. Sometimes we forget this. So their love and care for us is unconditional. In the effort of emphasizing the importance of making right choices, sometimes, you know, again, we turn Buddhas, we turn Dharma Palas into uh, this theistic uh, kind of punitive understanding of authority uh, of someone higher, uh, which we even learn by how our parents raised us. If your parents use you know, more punitive kind of ways to make you behave, then you will have that stronger baggage that you project on authority figures, including Buddhas, including your guru. Yeah. And then it's not very helpful. It's not very healthy. So thankfully, luckily, the Buddha's compassion are not affected by my confusion. That's a good one to remember, yeah? <laughs> so now coming back to these notes, it says, this conclusion, right? Mm. That, uh, so furthermore, if someone commits a fault due to delusion based on not knowing, it is a fault. The result is light. The consequence is light. But to knowingly commit a fault is to deprecate the Buddha's command and is thus the gravest, uh, the most terrible of faults. This conclusion, however, is not supported by Jigden Sumgan because delusion is the root of all other afflictions, such as desire and hatred, and hence, the root of samsara. So Jeshirap elaborates. Since they are dominated by cognitive misorientation, uh, avidya, delusion, and delusion, they do not realize the meaning of selflessness. Since they do not realize selflessness, they lack the eye that perceives the dependent origination of cause and result. Due to this lack, they are confused about the meaning of abandoning and the meaning of antidote. Because they do not know the difference between abandoning and accepting, based on that, they have no confidence in the dependent origination of cause and result. Because they are deluded with regard to karma, cause and result, they do not recognize virtue and evil. Because of that, even if they commit virtue, they do not know that they do not know the dedication of merit and committing evil they do not know confession since they have no remorse their evil acts weigh very heavily since they deprecate cause and effect result they do not transcend the result of being born in the three lower realms the root of all this is delusion Yeah, the root of all this is delusion. 
Uh, so this is also related to this point I've made before, you know, like, I don't know, uh, in other parts of the Americas, uh, but in the US, you know, people's attitude to doing good or being good is that uh, if you don't think about it, it's better. You know, if you don't think about it, it's better. It's more natural. You know, we like natural. Right? We'll say things like that. According to Jitin Sungun, no. If you are just simply doing virtuous things and, and not actually, you know, have, have this clarity, I am engaging in virtue. He says between the two, right, the second one is something that we have to encourage. Ah, that is virtuous. Uh, so meaning he says, you know, if, if, you're, if you, you know, like uh, see someone hungry, someone asks for, you know, a handout, as, you know, uh, help, you know, and you, you just give, right? And second scenario, you give and then you think, that's virtuous. That is good. He says, second scenario, better than first scenario. Because in second scenario, yeah, of course you have to guard against pride, of course. But in second scenario, there is understanding. Yeah. So then, thus not knowing, and in particular delusion about selflessness, is the root of all afflictions. Now, so Dojesh Sherab quotes uh, a uh, text, uh, an important text in the Tibetan system that teaches logic and reasoning, uh, Pramana Vartika. It says, if the notion of a self exists, the notion of other is conceived. From discriminating the self and other arise attachment and hatred. It is through being in connection with these two that all the defects come into being. So attachment and aversion comes from not knowing. Some other commentaries treat the statement because the animals have greater delusion, they are the lowest of the six beings, as a separate budget statement. But Chokidrakpa includes it within the present one. Other commentaries state the general opinion as follows. As follows. Some claim that concerning the lower realms, hells are lower, whereas the animal realms are higher. According to Jigden Sungun, however, the intention is that hell beings and hungry ghosts are much less deluded than animals and they understand their former faults, feel regret, and cultivate the intention not to commit faults again, which are all important steps towards the purification of evil. This is also why hell beings and hungry ghosts transmigrate more quickly than animals, meaning they get out of the hell realm and, and uh, hungry ghost realm yeah, more easily. Um, so here, yeah, again, mm, mm, this point about, uh, so you can think, you know, like the, the conventional way of talking about six realms and how, you know, the respective uh, undesirability of the six realms. Then from the perspective of Overt suffering, hell realms, most terrible. And from that perspective. And that's why hell realms is often considered the lowest. But that's from the perspective of, you can say, vipaka, result. From the perspective of cause, then the realm with the least understanding of what the heck is going on is the animal realm. And therefore, that, from that perspective, is the most dangerous because it keeps you perpetually trapped when you have no idea what's going on. So elsewhere, I've said, you know, between suffering with understanding and suffering with no understanding, suffering with no understanding is a greater fault. Then between being happy with understanding and being happy with no understanding, being happy with no understanding 
is dangerous. But being happy with understanding, then that can lead to more happiness. Being happy without understanding often leads to more suffering. Um, yes. When, well, I guess that when we're um, saying that uh, hell beings and uh, hungry ghosts um, can quickly uh, um, um, stay out of, well, uh, well, uh, transcend to a higher realm. Uh, well, it is because they understand cause and effect, and somehow, so they might be exposed to. Uh, uh, say, say, yeah, who again? Sorry, I missed the first part, Antonio. Uh, um, hell beings and hungry ghosts. Uh huh. Yeah, they. Um, well, because of their suffering, they can uh, think on cause and effect. Yeah, not because of their suffering, but they have the capacity to understand okay. uh, or to suspect uh, or to speculate, you can say. Oh, I'm here because, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what the Buddha taught. Okay, so, but they are not, they don't have to, they have to be exposed to teachings or something or some uh, inner um, search in order to do so. They don't need to be exposed to teachings explicitly. Right? Mm -hmm. We have examples of how these hell beings, uh, in the midst of all their suffering, they say, oh, I, 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 I don't want this. Right? This is, you know, I'm here because, you know, I created causes. And just that thought uh, purifies. Okay. Is that your question? I, I don't, maybe I don't yeah. understand what you're asking. Yeah, it, it, it's like uh, automatically you're going to go and think or you have to, well, you have the capacity to do so, but you're not going to. The point is you have capacity in ways that animal realm don't have that capacity. As mm -hmm. to for each being, how they are going to give rise to regret. I mean, that's all, you know, situational. Okay. Yes. The point is not about exactly how it happens. The point is, is there capacity or lack of capacity? Yeah. And animals, well, according to the story, one of the stories that we uh, studied before, the mm -hmm. one for our harmonious friends. Yes. They have like some, a little bit of capacity of... Yes, yes. That's why I said, that's why I said, Put that aside. Don't be worried about, you know, whether your dog or your cat is going to get out or not. Okay. To me, that's not the main point. The main point is don't be like a quote-unquote dumb animal yourself. <laughs> don't mm -hmm. suffer. Don't enjoy with no awareness. Yeah? There's certainly lots of stories yeah, in the Jataka tales yeah, where it shows that animals have the capacity to think and to make choices. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Uh, if okay. you want to get now to the level of, you know, uh, to the question of like, but really animals, yeah, do they have or do they have not? Well, lots of Jataka tales seems to suggest they have. Okay. Um, well, and I have a comment also on uh, when you realize that you are doing something virtuous, then you can dedicate in that moment, so yes, that's um, exactly. So that's why it says here, you know, like when you know, uh, when you know that is virtuous, you can dedicate mm -hmm. and then create even more. <clears throat> then, when you know that is non virtuous, uh, then you can purify, mm -hmm. and also then you can create, uh, you know, devotion because you know that this is something um, that is being 
taught by your guru and then you can see the effect on you and then yes exactly yeah okay. thank you mm -hmm. Other questions? <laughs> uh, the antidote for this uh, uh, for uh, confusion is uh, discrimination. It's, uh, uh, no, it's uh, understanding, it's clarity, it's, you know, it's many things, yeah. Learning the Dharma and, you know, mindfulness and remembering the Dharma. Uh, yeah, all, all, all those related to seeing clearly. Yeah? Yes. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So then based on uh, 17, therefore it follows. Uh, 18 is easy. So then 18. Yeah? Mm. It is taught that the fault of not obtaining the vow is greater than the fault of an impaired vow. Right? It's greater fault to not take a vow uh, than uh, to having taken the vow and now uh, you are in a situation where you have to break the vow. Because in the second situation, just as uh, there is capacity, uh, now uh, the vow is showing you that this is non-virtuous. So let's look at uh, uh, the commentary. So here, the commentary is pretty long, uh, but I don't think we need to go through all of it because uh, it's the commentary is longer because, um, in part, you know, uh, this this statement is quite shocking, you know, uh, <laughs> and and especially in the monastic uh, community and the rules of the monastic community, uh, this this could um, kind of be misinterpreted as you know. Uh, it's okay for you to break your vows. Uh, so, so Chodra has to handle this uh, in more detail. Yeah. So anyway, we can look at some of it. It says, when vows have been previously obtained, even the impairment, uh, that means damaging of the vows, is a light fault uh, due to the arising of regret. Because, you know, it's a light fault because uh, when you do something uh, and, and you know you, have, you, you should not do, uh, and because you have taken the vow, then, then regret arise, you know. And the benefit of obtaining vows and of the period of guarding them is inexhaustible. Not obtaining the vow, one does not see a fault as a fault. Uh, this statement is so clear, you know. If you, if you don't take the vow, <clears throat> yeah, so here, if you ask me, I would say, uh, even if you have not literally taken the vow, once you understand uh, that such a vow exists and understand why such a vow exists, then it already offers protection. Yeah? Just as it said earlier in that section about, you know, the full monk's vows and full nun's vows, even though we can say it doesn't apply to us, 
Uh, then it says, it only uh, doesn't apply to us in the sense of uh, we don't need to wear those robes uh, to externally look like one uh, because um, it's not appropriate also because we have not taken those vows. But to know those vows uh, and to try to keep, uh, you can say to the spirit of those vows, is always beneficial. Yeah, it's always beneficial. So here, not obtaining the vow, one does not even see a fault as a fault. Moreover, if one then acts with the flawed aspiration and mindfulness, thinking, quote, since I'm not like a fully ordained monk, it is appropriate to act like that. Then not obtaining the vow is heavier because of the greater evil. Right? So here it's saying, you know, like if you think, you know, oh, I'm not a fully ordained monk. You know, I, I, I can do this. No, no problem. <laughs> you know, which is like, like in the recent, you know, some of these scandals involving teachers, you know, I see people writing things about, you know, oh, but he was not a monk. Oh, so because he's not a monk, he can sleep around and especially like sleep around with his students. What are you talking about? You know? Or they're like, oh, well, he's not a monk. Huh? So he, he can dance, you know, uh, in the middle of the shrine room. No problem, you know. He didn't take the vow of not dancing. So what's your problem? Why, why are you, you know, giving him a hard time? It's that way of thinking, you know. Here, Kilbert and Bache are saying, no. <laughs> Whether you have taken the vow or not. See that, you know, a fault is a fault. <laughs> yeah, I see people saying that, you know, well, he has not taken a vow, you know, so he can, you know, but but people usually don't don't extend it to like oh he's not taken a vow he can lie steal and cheat <laughs> oh he's not a monk yeah it's okay he's lying and stealing and cheating <laughs> now there it's because people divide the vows into oh lying stealing and cheating those are naturally negative. Then there are other vows that are only negative because the Buddha said that they are negative for you guys, but not negative for you guys. What Kyoba Rinpoche is saying is like, no, 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 the Buddha doesn't make, make up rules just to torture a particular group and release the rules because for whatever reasons, he doesn't want to torture this other group. <laughs> Again, this is getting us to shift. Uh, to me, this is getting us to shift yeah, our attitude towards these vows and precepts. Do not look at these vows and precepts as burdens put on you, whether by Buddha, whether by the law of the land, whether by God, whether by tradition. But understand and relate to all these vows, all these precepts, all these samayas, as protective devices. Buddha's compassion helping us to protect ourselves from suffering. That's the only reason why Buddha gave any rule, any precept, any vow, any prohibition. It's out of compassion, wanting to protect us from suffering. Uh, so Vasubandhu, uh, already in the Abhidharma Kosha, uh, already said this, to do evil unknowingly is very heavy. Evil done by an informed person is lighter. An iron ball sinks deeper, even though it is smaller, 
if it is made into a container. Now, if it is made into a container, it floats on the surface of the water, even though it is larger. Oh, this is a very good example. Uh, equally, it's iron. But if it is shaped like a ball, even though the mass is less, it will pull whoever is attached to it. But the same iron material, even though the mass is deeper, if it is shaped into a box, it doesn't pull you if you're attached to it and someone chucks it into the water because then it will float. So the meaning here is you know, quite clear. So uh, uh, engaging in, in unskillful actions, negative causes, karma, uh, without knowing. It's like iron in the shape of a ball. Uh, and if you are attached to that and you throw it into the water, it'll pull you all the way down. Having the vows uh, is the same iron uh, but now shaped into a box. It will still pull you a little bit, uh, but it's not going to pull you to the bottom of the ocean. Furthermore, such stories as, of, as those of Nanda, Angulimala, Ajatashatru, and Udayana, and occurrences such as that of a monk who had killed his parents are known from the previous stories. So quoting this text from uh, Nagarjuna, uh, if someone who at first was mindless later becomes mindful, like a cloudless moon, like, uh, like Nanda, Agunlimala, Udayana, Ajatashatru, and Drisha, that is very beautiful. So all these quotes, eh? uh, and, and then further dividing uh, into, uh, this is, the, uh, you can read you know, yourself this commentary uh, for more details. Uh, then quickly, uh, Sobish's notes at the end of this chapter. Jigden Sumgan's statement is based on a calculation of advantages and disadvantages. He concludes that the benefits of taking the vows are to be regarded as a great advantage, while the disadvantages of not taking vows are weighty. This is so because when one has taken vows, the benefit of taking them and of keeping them for a period of time whatsoever is inexhaustible. And as explained in Vajra's Statement 316, once one has obtained a vow through the proper ritual, regret and shame arise in the face of transgression. Thus, such an impairment of the vows is not as bad as committing the fault out of delusion and in a state where one lacks the benefit of having vows. Still worse, one may even think that since I'm not ordained, then I'm free to disregard all prohibitions with impunity. <laughs> I'm free to regard, disregard all of it. You know, I, I never took those vows. I never promised to keep them. So I'm fine. So if you follow that conclusion, then the existence of these vows is very cruel right? The Buddha is very evil for even telling people about these vows. He says, how, how can that be? <laughs> because, you know, we still operate under this common saying, ignorance is bliss. If we look at it from the perspective of guilt, and of course, in our culture, you know, guilt is a big thing. So we want to avoid guilt at all. Huh? Completely, we want to avoid guilt because we are such a guilt-ridden culture. But nonetheless, huh? the Buddha is quite clear huh? that even though in the short term, guilt huh, might be really huh, suffering, if you don't have a sense of guilt, you will never think about changing the choices that you're making. So ignorance is not bliss. 
And conversely, guilt, uh, skillfully handled, uh, is your key to freedom. Uh, I said at the last, not the last teaching, which was yesterday night, uh, but the previous one, I say, you know, it is not as if that when we come to Buddha Dharma, uh, everything becomes crystal clear. All the choices that we make are going to be now easy. No. That will be huh? naive. That would be not living in the real world. That would be not really applying the Dharma in our lives, but superficially. When we have Buddha Dharma, it's not that suffering no longer turns up. It's that when suffering turns up, now suffering can have a meaning. A meaning that will be a key for our freedom. Before we have Buddha Dharma arising in our hearts, suffering has absolutely no qualities whatsoever. Suffering is just suffering. Completely meaningless. And therefore, yeah, very oppressive. But once Dharma has arisen in our hearts, now suffering has meaning. So before Dharma, we suffer. After Dharma entered our heart, we will still suffer. But now our suffering has meaning. Now our suffering has meaning. And the main meaning is, it's optional. <laughs> suffering is optional. On the realistic level, maybe pain is not optional, but suffering is definitely optional. Yeah, if you want a more biological-based understanding of your body, yeah, pain is your body's way of telling you something is wrong. Please pay attention and fix it if you can. So pain, maybe it's not optional, but suffering is definitely optional. The Dorshema and Rinjangma state that in general, obtaining teachings just once holds great benefit, even if one does not understand and later abandons them. Only those who obtain teachings and vows may attain liberation. Those who do not receive them will never attain it. From this perspective, it is better to temporarily undergo great suffering for damaging one's vows than to not take them. Since at least, quote, due to being connected to the Buddha's teachings, it is certain that one will obtain liberation in the end, unquote. Rinchen Chanchup quotes a passage from the Karuna Pundarika Sutra, according to which even someone who has once trained in the Shravaka ordination, but now roams through bars, forcing alcohol down the throats of his children, will attain nirvana within the present fortunate eon. Uh, stating a very extreme example. Uh, I have previously referred to a similar passage from the same sutra, cited in Karma Chakme's return. Karma Chakme continues there as follows. Therefore, that was the purpose of bestowing ordination on everyone without investigating whether they would be able to keep the vows or not even though it was clear to the learned and the accomplished ones, such as the father Jigden Sumgan and his sons, what would happen to them and how it would turn out. Someone who, having requested the vows, is not able to follow the rules, will experience terrible suffering in the lower realms and hells, but in the end will be liberated. This is called limited samsara. Right now, we have unlimited samsara. But someone like that will now have limited samsara. So yes, in the short term, more suffering and pain. But in the long term, they get out quicker. Those who commit non-virtuous deeds without even requesting the vows will never be liberated from samsaric existence. This is called unlimited samsara. 
No expiration date for this kind of samsara. So now I understand, you know, of course, I understood this for a while, but there was a time, you know, when Kinchen Rinpoche was um, the main resident lama at Tibetan Meditation Center, all kinds of people will come yeah, and ask for vows, ordination vows. Sometimes he would say to them, um, you know, you should finish college first. Yeah? So I, I'll show an example where, you know, Rinpoche is, is considering, you know, many factors. Yeah? I know some people, especially like young men, that come and say, oh, I want to be a monk. He said, you, you know, why, why don't you finish college, you know? Finish college first, and then, um, then, then we'll see. And then most of these people finish college, then they're like, oh, no, you know. <laughs> uh, but there were also many times where if older people, you know, uh, already working people, that comes to him and say, I want vows, and he gives them the vows, yeah? Then some of us are like, oh my God, this person is not a suitable person to take vows. Why does Rinpoche give it to them? It's because of this. Rinpoche is not just looking at this one lifetime. You know, in the cases where he just said, oh, okay, I'll give it to you. Yeah. Then of course, we are like, no, don't. Uh, there, there was one case, you know, like, like, basically, it's like a this couple, you know, they are like inseparable, but mysteriously, they said, Oh, we want to take the vows, you know. And us standing on the side are like, Ah, uh -uh. <laughs> look at the way they claw at each other, you know, they're not, they're not going to keep these vows. Rinpoche gave anyways, you know, and explained to them, you know, from now on, you know, you have taken the vows of celibacy and da, da, da. And, and, you know, seemingly they're like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, and, and we are like, oh my God, why is Rinpoche doing this, you know? Because <laughs> it's based on, you know, Luckily, the Buddha's compassion is not affected by my confusion. <laughs> you have to be brave also, you know. Kenshin Rinpoche often says, you know, one of the most important uh, qualities of bodhisattvas is to be brave. Because when you have understanding, right, you have understanding, you also need to be brave. What he means there is to be brave to face the short-term suffering for the long-term good. You have to be brave. Courage, he says. Courage is really important. You need to have great courage. Yeah. <laughs> So with this, we finish, you know, chapter three. Wow. <laughs> and we have finished uh, chapter one, chapter t one, two, three, and six. Four out of the seven main chapters uh, we have completed. So then, you know, we need to recognize Oh, this is virtuous. This is very good. And then dedicate this virtue. Dr. Lai? Yes. So uh, prior to going chic, um, I had a very, um, I don't know, fuzzy understand, understanding of Oh, it. yeah, we all do. And And even now I feel like I could go back yeah, and yeah. 
get a lot more. Yes, but, of course. But I feel like um, the vows are actually very exciting. It's like uh -huh. to think of your example, of whether you want to get to New York or Chicago, it's like the vehicle. Do I want to get the train? Do I want to get a bus? Do I want to get uh -huh. an airplane? You know, right. um, it's like, it's insurance that I'm going to get to where I need to get to. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, and these days put a mask on, okay? Whichever vehicle you're getting into, unless you're driving in your car alone. <laughs> driving around, I see people driving in their car alone, wearing the mask. That's very mysterious to me. Maybe it is the train to get used to, as we say, you know, to habituate. Then that's also good, you know, if you habituate wearing it. <laughs> Even when it seems unnecessary, if you habituate, then it's a lot easier. Yeah, so the gongjik, you know, uh, uh, what we're doing is just a first round. <laughs> And if we're lucky, we'll finish the first round, the first read, you know. And I hope, you know, after we've done the first read, right, you will go back uh, and look for more and more and more uh, in this about 900 pages here. You know, and look for more and more and more. Uh, but if we're able to go through at least once, uh, then, oh, I'm so happy you know? you know, of all the things that I'm teaching and spending time you know, doing with people. Uh, really, no, nothing is more satisfying than uh, this. Uh, it's also the truth, you know, some mornings, you know, you're like, eh, maybe I'll give, give an excuse and cancel class, you know. <laughs> and I'm sure you attending also, oh, uh, I don't know. I don't want to. <laughs> That's all normal, you know. That's all normal. Don't make a big deal out of that. Those things come and go, you know. Don't beat yourself over it. Huh? But also, no need to make a big deal like, oh, I don't have a connection with the teachings. Oh, I do have a connection with the teachings. That just, just exhausts so much energy. Just remember, luckily, thankfully, Hallelujah, <laughs> the Buddhist compassion is not affected by my confusion. So don't cut yourself off from the Buddhist compassion. That is the only way where maybe the Buddhist compassion can be affected by my confusion is for you to cut yourself out of Buddha's compassion. Otherwise, yeah, Buddha's compassion um, does not, it's not dependent on your confusion. <laughs> such, such a wonderful thing to be reminded of. In, so much so that there is, I, I mentioned this before, yeah? there is a medieval Japanese, uh, almost like cartoonish representation of the Buddha's compassion. Yeah, you all remember this? Yeah, where yeah, the bodhis Buddha is sitting there with two bodhisattvas, you know, uh, binding up someone, a reluctant person, yeah? and like pulling them towards Amitabha, right? like with chains and rope. That is to show, you know, the Buddha's compassion is so powerful uh, that in chains and rope, it will yank you uh, to the pure land. <laughs> this doesn't contradict what I said in class last night, you know. You cannot force the Dharma on anyone. Uh, that is a different context. That is a different context.
Yes, we cannot force the Dharma on anyone, including ourselves. If we force the Dharma on ourselves, it won't work. It will just backfire. Dharma, understanding and appreciation of Dharma has to be skillfully um, encouraged, skillfully uh, uh, like planting, you know, like gardening. It has to be skillfully tended. It has to be developed. You cannot force Dharma on anyone. But at the same time, it's good to know. But this compassion is not affected by our confusion. You can trust that. So now let's uh, do dedication of merit. Uh, as well as uh, I'm going to chant first the Amitabha. Uh, dedication, uh, uh, Pure Land dedication, actually right about uh, 20 minutes, uh, half an hour ago, I got a WhatsApp message uh, from uh, Maria Carmen uh, telling me that her mother uh, just passed away. Uh, her mother uh, is 90 something, really tough woman. I met her one time. I really like her. She's really tough, you know. The, the kind of mothers and grandmothers that I know, uh, really tough and gutsy. Uh, she single-handedly, you know, like raised her children. Uh, her name is Maria Elena Valenzuela. Yeah. Uh, somehow this morning when I woke up, when I looked at Facebook, I saw that His Holiness's uh, bodyguard, um, and uh, attendant of many years. Uh, he has two. One recently passed away, which is his cook and attendant. This other one is his bodyguard, driver, attendant, uh, Yang Pel. Uh, I saw that Yang Pel shared uh, a video that I took last year around this time in Bhutan, where His Holiness gave Powa uh, to thousands of Bhutanese. Uh, at the end, everybody was chanting Amitabha's uh, uh, aspiration prayer. So somehow, you know, I've seen that, you know, people keep sharing, you know, somehow this morning I looked at that and I go, yeah, I'm going to share this. And I also shared, reshare, and I shared it with the words of that uh, chant. Not, not really thinking anything in particular. And then um, about half an hour ago, so this is dendril. This is dependent origination that we're talking about, auspicious dependent origination. Yeah. So this is um, auspicious uh, dependent origination. Uh, so what I want to do is, let's see if I can get it to work. Let me pull up that, uh, uh, that particular video uh, and play it. Uh, and see if you can hear it. Uh, sometimes, uh, okay. So let me play loud. Uh, give me one second. Uh, let me go look for, let me go look for uh, the Bluetooth. Uh, Oh, oh, hold on, sorry. Uh, let me try another way.
Ero dedicate this to all the beings that are going through the transition into bardo. Uh, so uh, various people I know, uh, there are people that are close to you, uh, have made this transition uh, recently. Uh, someone uh, that was close to uh, Tere, 
also recently passed away. And so we dedicate it to all uh, the beings that are ma making through this transition. Uh, we are also going through transition, even in this life, in this body. Yeah? We are, all of us are in different parts of this transition of bardo. Yeah? So remember this. Thank you. Goodbye.